Hello, I'm Irene Plunkett. I'm emeritus faculty um, in higher education in California for 35 years. And on behalf of Veritas, its board, its executive director, and the Higher Education Working Group, I'd like to welcome you to this, our next presentation in a series examining labyrinths in higher education. Today's presentation is Creating Labyrinths on Campus with Veritas faculty, Lars Howlett and Dr. Jan Sellers. As you may know, other presentations in this series are available on the Veritas website. <clears throat> Today's presentation will be in two parts, with Dr. Jan Sellers addressing us first on portable labyrinths and other ideas, and Lars Howlett going second. Our focus today is on getting started and on considering materials, space, cost, and the specifics of locations. We know that every college and university has its own gifts and challenges so we encourage you to think about your own possibilities as you listen to our two guests today. And again, we welcome you. We're glad you were able to join us. Um, our first guest, we're very pleased to welcome back, uh, Dr. Jan Sellers, who lives in the UK. She trained with Lauren Artris as a facilitator at Chart initially in 2008, and then to advanced level in 2013. Her publications include Learning with the Labyrinth, Creative Reflect, Creating Reflective Space in Higher Education, Working with the Labyrinth, and the Labyrinth Society's revised and updated web pages. Jan began working with labyrinths following the award of a prestigious National Teaching Fellowship in 2007. Her work includes creation of the iconic Canterbury Labyrinth at the University of Kent. She has worked with Canvas Labyrinths since 2008 and has led many workshops, retreats, and quiet days with the labyrinth, both in education settings and further afield. Her canvas labyrinth travels with her to historic buildings and porta cabins, to libraries, dance studios, and lawns. She has created temporary labyrinths with ingredients including rope, hedge cuttings, chalk, and candlelight, and loves to teach the drawing techniques that enable anyone to do the same. For forthcoming events, please visit her website at jansellers.com. Welcome, Jan. We're so pleased to have you. It's so good to see you. Um, if you could talk to us a little bit about what a canvas labyrinth is, is it available in other materials? Again, um, as people are thinking about this, they might not be aware of this option. Thank you. And we'll just pause for a moment while I get some images of labyrinths up on screen. So welcome everybody and um, it's a delight to be here in the UK um, spending time with colleagues in America and friends around the world as we explore issues to do with the very practical um, approaches to introducing labyrinths on a campus setting. Um, this particular example is American students on summer school in the UK. Um, and I'll come back to this image later. Notice how this fits within the space because that's something that we're really going to need to be thinking about. Um, I'm just going to take a few moments to reflect on the fact that we don't have to have a canvas labyrinth or a permanent labyrinth to introduce labyrinths in a university setting. It is really worth considering learning how to draw a labyrinth and anybody can do this. Now for those of you without an artistic bone in your body, you mm -hmm. may be wincing slightly at this idea. Um, you could think of it as a technical challenge if you prefer, but there are very simple approaches to this. Um, and Lars and I have taught hundreds of people, but you can learn how to do this yourself. If you visit the Labyrinth Society's website, you will find specific directions on how to learn to draw a seven circuit classical labyrinth. Mm -hmm. If you then try practicing this, practice it, then get yourself a piece of chalk, get yourself a paving stone and scale it up, try it larger. 
sooner or later, with practice, you are going to be able to create something that is large enough for people to walk. That's the way I did it. I didn't go on a course. I got the handouts. I tried it for myself. Um, and eventually I learned how to do it fairly smoothly. Um, you'll also find these guidelines in the book Learning with the Labyrinth. And Lars and I are both, as it happens, um, we've both got labyrinth drawing workshops coming up soon. So that's another thing that you can explore um, if you'd like to take that group approach. Um, but it can be as cheap as, well, I walked a labyrinth the other evening that was simply made out of wisps of wool and candlelight. <laughs> it was just extraordinary. So I don't want anybody to feel that this is too expensive to try. It doesn't need to be. Good point. And equally, um, introducing finger labyrinths. These, are, these can be handheld. I hope you can get a sense of the size of these from the tools here. You've got in front of you three examples of wooden finger labyrinths. Um, the one on the left is the um, Chakra Vyuha labyrinth, um, very, uh, very ancient labyrinth design um, with Indian and Sri Lankan connections. Mm -hmm. And the one in the centre is the classical seven circuit labyrinth, the right. oldest pattern that has yet been found. A labyrinth pattern that does not belong to any single tradition, any single culture or country. So it's a lovely introduction um, yes, as a way of introducing the labyrinth on campus. And these are particularly useful both for wheelchair users who don't feel able to move on a large scale floor laid canvas labyrinth. They're also useful for people who are blind or partially sighted. Mm -hmm. But to be quite honest, they are beautiful devices for anybody to use. Yes. And they don't have to be portable. Um, you can look at a um, permanently fixed labyrinth. These are both at the University of Kent in Canterbury, one of them wall mounted in the chapel and the other one simply carved into a nearby bench. Both of them um, supporting quiet reflective space. Right. But let's now go on to think about canvas labyrinths. And here is um, the second canvas labyrinth that I've worked with. Um, here being unrolled, you can see that when that's rolled up, it's small enough to travel in the suitcase. Mm -hmm. This is a very portable resource. Uh, this, ca this canvas labyrinth travels between campuses. It's gone to conferences. Um, it's traveled all over the place. Um, very easy, very straightforward, both to unpack, as you can see, and to roll it up. Um, now, one of the things that people sometimes worry about is unrolling it, laying it out, fine. What do I do first time round when this huge <laughs> canvas is laid out in front of me? Here, for example, how do I pack this up? <laughs> <laughs> well, good question. We've moved from one of the smaller canvas labyrinths. The one that's being unrolled there is about 24 feet, about eight meters across, to um, one of the largest available. This is the 11 circuit chakra pattern. It's um, about 36 feet across. Um, about 11 meters mm. and this particular labyrinth um, comes in usually in three sections that are velcroed together and what you can see here are three students at the World Parliament of Religion mm. they are actually working on the velcro lines to smooth up the attachments so that the labyrinth can very easily be walked mm. But you can see here that this is a labyrinth that takes up a great deal of space. Mm -hmm. So 
you can see the labyrinth um, set up there. You can see what the room looked like um, before we filled it up with a canvas labyrinth. Oh, great. Let's consider some practicalities. So your question, Irene, are labyrinths of this kind always made out of canvas? Well, no, I'm going to show you a calico version mm -hmm. later on. Um, the advantage of the heavyweight canvas, this is the same as sailcloth or theatre backdrop. Mm -hmm. And you can walk fast on this, you can dance on it. Mm. And a number of people can walk this at the same time without it getting too crinkled. Mm. The thinner the fabric, the more likely you are to be able to, to, to need to quickly move around and just smooth it out from the edges. Because you'll understand that with people moving around on it, the fabric does move very slightly, okay. but something this heavy is very solid, very carefully laid out. It will stay steady for quite a while. All right. But we also need to think about how much space have we got? And if you are wondering about getting a canvas labyrinth, then please go away with one key message. Don't buy it, don't order it, until you've got somewhere lined up where you can regularly lay out your labyrinth and you know that it will fit. So, first of all, negotiate for a regular space where you can hold a labyrinth walk. Make sure it's somewhere where the floor can be clean and swept and not not sticky. Right. Not a good idea to use the dining hall. Right. Because these labyrinths are hand painted works of art. They are designed to be walked on, but the surface is not sealed. And so they are not wipe clean. It is possible to purchase acrylic or vinyl labyrinths, and those are easier to keep clean. On the other hand, they have not got the natural quality of undyed canvas underfoot. Right. So a lot of people do prefer these canvas labyrinths where it's mm -hmm. feasible. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I do with a few friends before we walk, before we lay out the labyrinth is to walk it with socks, no shoes. We just walk the space and check that there are no hidden sticky marks and no hidden damp patches so that the labyrinth does not get stained. And then when you're thinking about the size of your space, visit it and have a really careful look around. Is there fixed furniture that cannot be moved? Are there radiator pipes <laughs> or pillars? Are there fire doors, as in this image, that might just need to open out onto the fabric in an emergency. Where you have radiators, are those pipes going into that radiator from the wall or from the ground? Because all of these can affect the amount of space you've actually got. Lastly, it is entirely possible to place chairs on a labyrinth surface for people who can perhaps only walk part of the way. And this is about making the labyrinth experience inclusive. Mm -hmm. You can see that chair in the middle it looks as though it's got rather odd feet. And this is because I've purchased um, chair leg cups. And I don't know what you call these in the USA that mm -hmm. are there to cushion um, right. um, sofa legs right. so that they don't damage carpet. Mm -hmm. You can use just the same way with these chairs. I carry a set around for me. Um, I also invite people to put on a clean pair of socks or shoe covers and I provide those. <laughs> and for me doing the laundry is just comes with the job, you know? Yes. <laughs> um, but it helps to keep the surface. <clears throat> so let's move on. Here is a delightful labyrinth 
that was made by the folks at the University of Westminster. And they drew out and designed the pattern. This is a calico labyrinth. Mm -hmm. You can see that it will crinkle slightly more than a canvas does. But this is a very low cost means of creating a labyrinth. And this is perfectly fitted into this narrow seminar room. Yes. It will wear out sooner than a canvas, but it can be replaced much more cheaply than a canvas labyrinth can. Excellent. And a step up, if you like, this is a labyrinth that has been professionally drawn, but has then been hand painted um, by the people at St. Bennett's Chapel. And this reduces the cost of a canvas labyrinth by about a third. Mm. And there are a number of companies out there that will provide this service. Um, we will see if we can provide some information about companies later on. But if you um, look around, if you look on the Veriditas website, if you look on the Labyrinth Society website, you are going to find organisations and companies that provide painted labyrinths and that will provide this service. Excellent. And this is an example of simply sharing space. There was not room on campus for this particular event. It was an intensive creativity week with arts and design students. And so the university chaplain liaised with the people at the local church and we were able to hold this particular workshop in this glorious setting. For some of you, space will not be an issue, but for many, many campuses, um, space is critical and it's worth thinking of all the possibilities. I've given examples of labyrinths that are about 24 feet wide and 36 feet wide, 8 metres and 11 metres. It is entirely possible to get labyrinths made of different sizes. Um, and the labyrinth that you are looking at here is my own canvas labyrinth. It's a medieval style, uh, modelling the pattern of the Canterbury labyrinth, um, which is the permanent labyrinth at the University of Kent. And this canvas is about 21 foot 6 inches across. Um, it, that is about... Okay, I made a note of it. It's about six and a half metres, um, just to give you a sense of the possibilities. So they can be tailored. If you've only got one room that can be used, then you can, I would hope, find a labyrinth that would fit this space. And Irene, I'm going to ask you to move on to the next question. Well, I was um, getting ready. I was just gonna say, thank you. I was gonna say, this is so helpful. I just wanna make a couple of notes. Um, obviously, Jan knows a great deal about this, and she's taken her encyclopedic knowledge and given us a very uh, small snippet of what she, what she knows. And I was just going to invite you to um, finish the presentation. The, I think you have a couple more slides, and then I think we'll go into Lars, because you've given us, I think, just a glorious introduction into portable canvas possibilities the considerations particularly of space, which I think are so critical for our participants to think about. So maybe you have a couple of more images you'd like us to see first? Um, well, we're gonna stay with this one for the moment. Um, and I'm aware that colleagues at the University of Central Lancashire have asked a question about um, what happens when students are skeptical and are reluctant to engage when you start using a canvas labyrinth on campus how do you convince them this is something that we could take an hour to discuss it's a profound question and it goes to the heart of our work i would say that the time for convincing people is when you are at the beginning of a labyrinth project on campus and you are seeking space you are seeking funding, you are seeking the support of colleagues across the university or college. 
When it comes to teaching and learning with the labyrinths, this for me is not about convincing people. What we're doing is offering an opportunity, a different way of learning. And one of the ways in which the labyrinth is situated in a teaching and learning context to a growing extent is in the context of contemplative pedagogy. Now we touched on that um, slightly more in the last webinar and that is available free of charge for, for people to view. So you may want to have a look at that and you will see there on the um, tree of contemplative learning um, that labyrinth walking has a place. So we can invite students and colleagues to join us. We can invite them to explore this as one of the possibilities for fostering creativity, for deepening reflection, for quietening the mind. And just like the university experience itself, the opportunity is there for them to take up, but it is not going to work for everybody. And that's why we have a whole range of teaching possibilities in our portfolio. You asked me in discussion earlier, Irene, if I would just end with a couple of brief examples of what for me have been highlights in teaching and learning with the labyrinths. And this symposium was one of them. It's very simple, a labyrinth walk which greeted participants on their first evening at this symposium for research students and for academics um, coming together for a rare opportunity. Um, and this was a way of letting go of our experience of traveling and preparing heart and mind for the work that we had to share. Equally, I'll finish with an example of working with students in dentistry, where they were talking about the competitiveness. These were dental nurses about to launch on their careers. And we used a labyrinth walk to raise concerns and to highlight the values and strengths with which they as graduating students were going out to face the wider world as professionals in their own field. So I'm going to pass over to Lars now, just wanting to say thanks to the colleagues that have shared their photographs and to Macmillan Higher Education, um, who have also granted photo permissions for this presentation. Thank you very much. And um, I'm going to go over to Irene and to Lars now. Thank you so much, Jen.